Yeah, let's bring you some breaking news now coming to us from Atlanta in the States concerning the execution of Troy Anthony Davis. He has now been put to death by lethal injection in Georgia. That was after a number of last-ditch appeals to prevent the execution. Unfortunately, they failed. Uh, it's a case that has captured worldwide attention. Uh, it was halted this morning, um, but then the US Supreme Court ruled no stay of execution. This is the man accused of murdering an off-duty policeman in 1989. He's been in prison in Georgia for 20 years. He was meant to be executed by lethal injection at midnight our time, this morning that was. Um, it didn't go ahead. The US uh, Supreme Court ruled no stay of execution and now we're hearing that he has been put to death. Troy Davis was put to death by lethal injection at a prison in central Georgia. Uh, the reason this case drew such international attention uh, was because his lawyers claimed that evidence against him was false and misleading. Uh, there were reports that the evidence was overwhelming, that the conviction Troy Davis's conviction was unreliable and uh, last-ditch appeals by his lawyers did fail. Uh, we're going to go now to a press conference in Atlanta. J-O-N-L-E-W-I-S. Basically, it went very quietly. The McPhail family and friends sat in the first row. Warden read the order, asked if Troy Davis had anything to say, and Davis lifted his head up, looked at that first row, and made a statement in which he said he wanted to talk to the McPhail family and said that despite the situation you're in, he was not the one who did it. He said that he was not personally responsible for what happened that night, that he did not have a gun. He said to the family that he was sorry for their loss, but also said that he did not take their son, father, brother. He said to them to dig deeper into this case to find out the truth, he asked his family and his family and friends to keep praying, to keep working and keep the faith. And then he said to the prison staff, the ones he said who are going to take my life, he said to them, may God have mercy on your souls. And his last words were to them, may God bless your souls. Then he put his head back down, the procedure began and about 15 minutes later it was over. Any, any questions? Questions? Oh, okay. <laughs> no, it's just pretty much they picked me. Um, well, we'll all do it, but any questions? Um, if you want more exact quotes, we can get them to you. Yeah, that would be great. Um, okay, I'm Rhonda Cook with the Atlanta Journal Constitution. He said the incident that night was not my fault. I did not have a gun. And that's when he told his friends to, to continue the fight and look deeper into this case so you can really find the truth. For those about to take my life, may God have mercy on your souls. May God bless your souls. And, um, and to the McPhail family, he said, of course, uh, I did not personally kill your son, father, and brother. I am innocent. Uh, there was more security than usual at this execution. There was more security than usual at this execution, uh, but otherwise it went uh, as as other executions have gone here. Uh, there was there was tight security, but the prison folks here are professionals and they've done this before, um, and it went pretty much as planned. Um, I have the execution starting at around 10:53, and he was declared dead at 11:08. How did he look? Was he talking in a loud voice, a quiet voice? Um, he was talking very quickly. Um, and, and as, as um, you know, my colleagues have said, he was defiant until the very end, uh, and maintaining his innocence until the very end. Um, he spoke quickly. He looked at um, one of his attorneys who was sitting on the second row. He, he appeared to glance at the attorney who nodded at him. Um, the, uh, Mark McPhail was sitting in the front row, and he was looking at, uh, Mark was looking at, him, uh, at Mr. Davis the entire time, it seemed. Um, and uh, 
once he was uh, declared dead, we were ushered out. And how would you describe the mood? Somber. Uh, how else? Uh, it was just a somber, uh, somber, somber event. Uh, we were all waiting uh, for about four, four and a half hours in the prison with no, with no details on what was happening. Um, and then when we were ushered into the, uh, to the prison itself, we, we knew that, we, we assumed at least the Supreme Court had rejected his, uh, his, final, uh, his final appeal. We saw two, the, bro uh, the officer's brother, his name is William, and Mark and McPhail. Did they have any Mark reaction, McPhail, they have any Jr. reaction when uh, he maintained his innocence until he had it? No, Mark McPhail leaned forward through the whole process and his uh, uncle, William McPhail sat back and, and neither seemed to move at all. They spent the entire time just staring at Troy Davis, never turned their heads, never did anything but stare ahead. And then when it was over, uh, as they were leaving, they hugged somebody and they seemed to smile about it. So for the McPhail family, at least, uh, they seemed to um, to get some satisfaction from what happened. Who was, who was, who was, who was, who was there from the uh, McPhail family? Pardon? Mark McPhail Jr., his son, and his bro and the officer's brother, William McPhail. Can you talk to him about what Troy Davis was saying? Beg your pardon? Can you talk to him about what Troy Davis was saying until the end? He was saying he was innocent. He said to the McPhail family, again, that he was not the one responsible for what, he was not personally responsible for what happened that night. He said that he did not have a gun. He said that he was not the one who took their son, father, brother, and he said he was innocent. Um, and that was to the end. He, he lifted his head up. He was strapped to the gurney when we walked in. And when the uh, warden asked if he had to make a statement, he lifted his head up and looked directly at the front row, which is where the McPhail family and friends were sitting, and um, said, I want to address the McPhail family, and made sure they heard what he had to say, which was that he claimed he was innocent. He was not responsible for what happened that night in 1989. He did not have a gun. He was not personally responsible for the death of Officer McPhail. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but this is what he was saying. Then he addressed his friends and family, telling them to keep praying, keep working, to keep digging into this case. And then he said to the staff, he said to the people who are about to take my life, may God have mercy on your souls and may God bless your souls. And then that was it. Did the McPhail family have any kind of physical or even verbal we, response? We couldn't see their faces. They were sitting in the first row, so we did not see how they reacted to it. All I can say is, Watching them while this was going on, they never turned their heads, they never wavered. The entire time they just stared at him through the glass as the execution was taking place. Uh, the execution was delayed for about four hours. Do you know if he was, Troy Davis was strapped to the gurney the entire time? I have no idea. We weren't there. I didn't see anybody. Just the attorney for him. Brian Kenner was that? No, it was uh, uh, Ewart, Jason, Jason Ewart. Ewart. Do you know whether Davis was answered last meal or anything about his last meal? That I don't know. I don't believe he did have a last meal, and I don't believe he made a final statement when he was going to be given the opportunity to record one. But he did make the statement, as we've said, uh, while he was uh, strapped to the chair, oh, strapped to the gurney, and um, again addressed directly to the McPhail family first to let them know that he said claimed he was innocent. He did not. He did not eat his dinner, and he did not take the Ativan. Did he participate in a prayer? I know that's something they offer. He was offered, but he did not. And then they started the execution. He blinked rapidly for some period of time, uh, and then um, he went out. They checked him for consciousness. Warden came back into the death chamber, went back out again, and then they started the uh, lethal mixture. And again, the whole thing took about 15 minutes. 11.08, the warden came in and pronounced him dead. Did he make his final statement uh, on, the, on the coach? On the, on the gurney? Sorry. He was strapped to the gurney when we came in. So everything that happened, he was already strapped to the gurney. We came in, the warden was in the room with him, another prison official, uh, a medical attendant plus one that was uh, off to the side, and then Troy Davis strapped to the gurney. The warden read while we were there, uh, read the order from the Chatham County judge, asked Troy Davis if he had any statement. Davis made his statement. They ordered the procedure to go on. He asked if he had a prayer first. There was no response. Warden stepped out of the death chamber and then it started.
Okay, we were just hearing there from some of the witnesses to the execution of Troy Davis. One there from a local radio station, John Lewis, who said that Davis went peacefully and uh, just before he was put to death, he said he was not responsible for the death of Mark McPhail in 1989. He said he was sorry for McPhail's family's loss, but he did not take their son and brother. He protested once again, I am innocent. I did not have a gun on that night in 1989. Uh, and the witness also said it was all over in 15 minutes and that security was tighter than normal. And uh, Troy Davis was put to death at 11.08 local time. That's eight minutes past four our time.